Today's presenter, Russell Jackman, is a graduate of the McGeorge School of Law, University of Pacific, and was admitted to the State Bar of California in June of 1994. He has been vice chair of the California State Bar's Law Practice Management and Technology Committee and a member since 1996. He works specifically with law offices and attorneys that need to get the most out of their legal technology and creates PowerPoint presentations for opening statements, direct examinations, and closing statements to be used in court and can work with attorneys directly to filter their documents and images so that they have the most powerful visual presentations possible. He also works with law offices and solo attorneys to upgrade their older systems to new ones, troubleshooting existing setups and training attorneys and staff on Microsoft programs. He is available for remote access consulting on technology related issues so please feel free to contact him at any time. Welcome to Demystifying Computers for Attorneys. My name is Russell Jackman, and this is for the Center for Continuing Education. And um, I've been a computer consultant and attorney uh, for 20 years. And so uh, this is always a lecture that I've, I've done in the past um, because I don't think a lot of uh, uh, times there's a zoomed out lecture for uh, for attorneys to even explain what goes on with computers. And there's a lot of terms and a lot of phrases and a lot of concepts that are sort of assumed to be understood by a lot of people. And they really don't know that that's the case. And unless you grew up with computers and not everyone did, or even if you did, but maybe you forgot about some of these things, this, this lecture is here to sort of explain a lot of the terms and a lot of the phrases and a lot of what they mean um, and what the numbers mean and, and what you're looking for when you hear certain terms or phrases um, so that you can understand the environment that you're working in. Because the computer is an integral part of every business that operates. And believe it or not, attorneys, your, your law office is a business. That's why the ABA, um, the very first rule, 1.1, dealing with confidence, talks about a lawyer providing competent representation to a client, competent representation requiring legal knowledge, skill, thoroughness, and preparation reasonably necessary for the representation. In the day, obviously, that meant you had to have a filing cabinet and a typewriter and a copy machine and the ability and, and a working phone to run a law office. Um, and you had to have maybe a secretary and or a, uh, a, a paralegal that was working with you to make all these things coordinate and make that happen. Well, a lot of attorneys now, especially ones that are working on their own, or have left a big firm um, and are considering, you know, transitioning to retirement or just starting out and can't get hired by a big firm. Your ability with a computer today to compete along the same lines as a big firm is possible. But you have to use it in the right way. In other words, David would only beat Goliath if he really knew how to shoot that sling stone perfectly and hit the giant right in the middle of the forehead or wherever he hit him to knock him out uh if you don't use the sling right you know little david isn't going to be able to knock out goliath you're going to have to use the that tool perfectly to be able to give yourself the edge and to be able to represent your clients as competently as possible so that way Competent representation being really amounts to being able to use your computer the way that a business uses them and the way that businesses use them successfully. And to do that, you need to understand what the computer is all about. Um, I'm not saying that you, you know, are going to, after this lecture, go and build your own computer or, uh, you know, uh, uh, 
do all your own IT work yourself. Um, but as you know, with when you work with a car or you know any other piece of other technology that you have, the more you understand how, how it works, the components and how they work, the easier it is for you to understand if there's something going wrong with it or what you need to do to upgrade to make uh, improvements so that they uh, work out better for you, you know, when you're uh, 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 working with them on an everyday basis. So but let's talk about what is a computer. Um, with the CPU, uh, you have uh, the central processing unit which is um, also known as a tower or as my uh, soon to be nine year old twins refer to it as a, a grandpa box. Um, it's, it's the traditional design of the computer where you have um, uh, a main terminal box um, where the, the processor is actually, the CPU itself is housed. And then you have, um, it is connected to what's known as a motherboard that then has connections on the circuit board to all these connectors in the back, which really make everything happen for you. So for instance, the, the serial port and the uh, uh, monitor port and the USB drives and the, you know, the USB ports and the microphone and, and speaker jack and the power supply, they all hook into the motherboard and the CPU is the traffic cop that explain, uses a set of instructions built into it to tell how all these things work together at the same time. So that, and that brings you your computer experience. Okay. And normally, you know, you have everything plugging in through a variety of different wires, including USB cables, which stands for universal serial bus or you have um, the microphone jack, or you have the power cord. So it, it, different cables hook up to different uh, devices and they provide either power or connection from the computer to the, uh, to the device and back and forth. They will, it sends information back and forth. And we're seeing a bigger growth away from wires and some more wireless technology we'll talk about later. Now, the, a, a more recent trend has been towards basically what they call an all-in-one. And um, those are very popular, especially in areas with less space. Basically, what they do is they, with the way that flat screens now take up so little space, they're able to build the computer actually behind the monitor itself. So there's what you call zero footprint, or the only, the only space that it takes up is the thin level of the monitor and the width that the monitor takes up. Um, plus, you do have, you know, the keyboard and mouse, although some all-in-ones include touch screens so that you don't even have to worry about the space that a mouse and keyboard will give. Um, and then on the smaller side, and the same concept is that you have tablets, which I, most people are familiar with when it comes to iPads. Um, these tablets have, uh, this, a lot of them have the same power that a large computer used to have just a couple of years ago. And um, certain tablets like say the um, uh, Surface, the Microsoft Surface is a full fledged computer. It doesn't run on a different operating system which we'll talk about later. It has the Windows operating system. You can plug in printers and, 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 and other peripherals to it. And then finally, your phone is really a computer too now. I mean, unless you're still using a flip phone, which I'm sure we have a few in this audience who might still be working on an old style flip phone, but if you have any kind of a smartphone, even one from two, three years ago, um, it's more powerful than a desktop from four or five or six years ago because of the processor that they are now capable of putting inside phones. So, um, I mean, I know people have phones that, you know, basically have more storage in them than the laptops that they bought just a few years ago, just because um, uh, uh, memory 
and storage has gotten so cheap and so small and so capable in the last couple of years. So that's always something that, that is developing too. So there's a lot of different computer types that are available. And by and large, when you get a, 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 a system that is a tower, you're going to get something that's more powerful than, than what you'll get in an all-in-one and certainly what you'll get in a tablet. But those things are beginning. That gap used to be really large. And now that gap is really shrinking. So what are computers made of? As I mentioned, the central processing unit is the 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 traffic cop and it's the the instruction provider that controls the speed of processing and it runs in what's known as a gigahertz speed so when you see the numbers it's always going to be uh 3.5 gigahertz or 4 gigahertz or 6 gigahertz or 1 gigahertz and of course the faster the gigahertz the better they, right now, they're known as Intel as is the leading creator of processors. And they have different series of processors. One's called an i3, another's called an i5, then there's an i7, and now just introduced was an, is an i9, which, you know, over the years, if I give this lecture, I'm sure the i9 will move down and there'll be an i11 or, or an i15. It just... That's the way, you know, computers go. They're always adding to it. And they add what's called generations of those particular chips. So um, if you have, let's say you bought a computer six years ago and you bought an i7, that would be maybe like a third, second or third generation i7. Well, that actually is not going to be faster than a sixth generation i5 just because they take the i5s and make them, soup them up and make them faster and faster and faster. So that if you have an older generation i7, you can't see, you, you, you might say, oh, well, I have an i7, it should be running faster than the i5, but the generations really matter. Now, and uh, a sixth generation i7 is gonna blow the doors off in a sixth generation i5 or an i3. So within the same generation, you're gonna, you'll have the faster processors um, being the higher number, but um, with it across generations, every time they add a generation to it, um, you get a lot faster speed. So some people are like, well, I, you know, I saw a, a six generation i5 and it was selling, it was more expensive than a, a third generation i7. And that's because it actually runs fast. So if you can find something right now that's in the sixth generation or higher, that's a, good, uh, that's a good place to go. And then AMD is the other maker of processors. And they, make, they, they create stuff within what's called a series. And they have uh, right now five through nine, and it's sort of the same as in, Intel. They're both great CPUs. So I'm not going to sit here and say that if you have an AMD, you need to get an Intel processor. You're an Intel processor, you have to have an AMD. I've had both in the years that I've owned computers, and um, by and large, I've been happy with all the computers that I buy. So um, uh, I'm not trying to endorse one maker of CPUs over the other. Now, memory is different than processing speed. It's related to processing speed, and both of them work to influence the other. But memory deals with how many tasks you can do at one time. Um, so what we have is DDR, which is called double density RAM. And that's random access memory. That's not storage. So random access memory is the, we could almost call that short-term memory. It, it allows you to do more tasks at once. The more the more memory you have, the more RAM you have. So um, a few years ago, they used to have computers that had four gigs of RAM in them. And that was okay because the tasks weren't as complicated and people weren't doing as many at one time. 
but as we've increased the amount of memory that it takes to process video, process the internet, to process more complicated programs and app, apps that we're running, we need more RAM to make that work. So it's, 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 it's like the, uh, it, but you also need a fast enough processor to be able to move the information into the memory and then from the memory out to the different peripherals that are plugged in to make your computer experience work. So in other words, if you have a computer that's got a very low processing speed, but a lot of RAM, it'll run well to a point, but it's not going to get any faster because the processor speed is slowing it down. And what I see even more often is a computer that's got a high processing speed, but not enough RAM in it. And so you can't do enough tasks without it slowing down or crashing because it can't handle the more, to, it can do one task very quickly, but when you try to tell it to do five or six different tasks that are memory intensive, like streaming or watching video or something like that, it will slow down and or crash because it can't put that many things in its mind at the same time. So that is again to be juxtaposed to storage, which again is a, very, is a different concept. Uh, that's your hard drive and that's how much you can store the programs, the apps, the data, the, the pictures, the music, the videos, the documents. That's, you know, like having a large uh, 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 trunk of your car or having, you know, a large back seat. Storage is important. And having fast storage so you can retrieve those items is helpful. But that in itself won't make things faster if your CPU is too slow and your memory isn't enough. So I see, again, Sometimes attorneys make the mistake of saying, well, I just got a new hard drive. How come my computer isn't running faster or it's not running as fast as I thought it would? Um, would and, and a question I get a lot is, will making room on my hard drive make my computer run faster? Usually it won't, unless your hard drive is so full that there's no room at all on it, that will make your computer run slow. But even if you have just a little bit of room on your drive, by and large, uh, a, 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 a hard drive is the, deleting things on your hard drive doesn't make it run faster. Now, that being said, there are things that you can, there is a way that you can speed up your hard drive access, and that's by switching the type of drive, but we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, storage is, is now marked by terabytes or 1,000 gigs per terabyte. You may still see some 500 gig hard drives and, and especially with maybe newer computers that have the uh, uh, SSD drives that we're talking about um, they, uh, that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, those are, st are still kind of small. They may be 128 gigs or 256 gigs. Keep in mind that to run Windows or the Apple operating system, you really should have 40 gigs at least of open hard drive space, just so that you have room for updates and for any uh, changes that I may mean, have to make to the operating system. I like to have, it has to have, there has to be some overhead. If you run your hard drive down to the very last byte, it's a bad idea, and I wouldn't recommend it to anybody. Keep in mind, a standard HD movie is two to four to eight gigs a piece. So um, a thousand gigs, well, it seems like a lot, and it is a lot. These days, it gets used up surprisingly fast. Uh, when you have family photos, uh, family videos, like I do with my twins, it eats up your hard drive more than you expect. And I actually had to move to a two terabyte hard drive. Now I'm about more than halfway 
through that one. I thought I'd never get through a terabyte hard drive. I never thought I'd get through a 500 gigabyte hard drive. And granted, one of the things that happens is you become kind of a, 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 a collector or a hoarder of sorts, a cyber hoarder, and you start just keeping things on there, quote unquote, just in case. And, and I have programs and apps and, and, and movies and things like that that I'm never going to watch again and that I could easily delete free up the space on, but somehow I'm too lazy and I just keep it around and then I just move it from one computer to the other and I just keep this collection of garbage going. But, you know, you never know when you're going to need an old document. So um, what are peripherals? Um, peripherals, I guess uh, I get a question about that every once in a while. And it simply means the things that you hook up to your computer, things like your LED screen. Um, and now most computers can handle dual screens without any kind of a slowdown or additional hardware. You can get most, most desktops that you get, either uh, uh, all-in-ones or uh, 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 towers contain a uh, second port that you can hook up to another monitor. And even laptops and a lot of tablets have an external monitor port on them so that you can plug that in. And there's ways you can extend that port to two different ports, or you can use a USB port and turn a USB port into an additional monitor port. And I have clients that will use their laptops as a desktop um, by taking it um, home and plugging it into a, uh, a what's called a docking station, but more recently they're, they're called port replicators. And these port replicators will allow them to leave a monitor, a keyboard, a mouse, a printer, a network cable, um, anything else that you would plug in, plugged into this one box. And with one cable, USB cable, you plug it into your computer and all those things activate. And then when you want to take the laptop with you, you just unplug it and take your laptop with you. So that's a good option if you want to use your laptop in multiple locations and use it with the benefit of the desktop because I really don't recommend that people use the laptop and keyboard and screen unless they're you know traveling with it. It's, if you can use a full size monitor and keyboard uh, and mouse, it's better for you ergonomically and it just is more powerful when you're using it in that fashion. I just had a client convert over to that after using a laptop for years. And she's like, oh, the new monitor, it's so great. Can't believe I was squinting and leaning forward all those years. And I said, like, yeah, now you can sit back and see everything on the screen in large size when you're, if you don't, if you don't need to put it on your actual lap because you're traveling on a plane or, you know, commuting, there's really no reason when you're working at home to have a laptop screen and, and not take advantage of a full-size screen and keyboard. Um, we're also seeing that webcams are becoming very commonplace. Um, but they used to be optional. Now people are using it for their Zoom meetings and working remotely. Um, uh, speakers and headphones. Um, and then all these different items can be accessed by a cable, but a lot of them now can use what's known as the Bluetooth connectivity, which is a built-in wireless networking tool that allows you to connect different peripherals without using a wire. So um, uh, Bluetooth headsets are really convenient. Um, a lot of people are, are using Bluetooth connections for their phones to move data between their phones and their computer. Um, uh, 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 people have Bluetooth wireless keyboards and mice because then you don't have that separate wireless adapter that you have to that uses up a USB plug. So, um, and then they have Bluetooth uh, uh, game controller. So it's, it's, an, it's an option that people are beginning to use more and more. And if you're curious about Bluetooth, it, you can look at the different devices that have it and see if that sort of wireless freedom would, would help you. And then um, we are seeing uh, uh, external hard drives really become 
big. Um, I, I saw one the other day that the client had that was five terabytes. He works with a lot of images, and uh, that to me is just colossal. But it wasn't very expensive. It was around four or five hundred bucks. Um, uh, uh, and then the other thing that is a uh, situation is that a lot of attorneys are surprised, but it's true. You really are seeing the death of CDs and DVDs. Everything is is streaming right now, and and there are a lot of computers that you buy these days, especially laptops, to save space and to save room. They're eliminating the CD DVD drive. And so if you have a CD DVD collection, um, you you know, and you don't, and you're thinking of upgrading your computer, you may either have to get an external CD, DVD drive to be able to play those CDs, or you have to think about converting them. By, by and large, most people are using flash drives now because the, uh, the CD, CD holds 700 megabytes of information. So not even a gig, it's a little short of a gig. And the DVD holds 4.75 gig, gigabytes of data. Anyway, um, so yeah, with with hard drive, with flash drives, you can hold 128 gigs. You can hold even more than that. I've seen um, people being able to hold up to a terabyte on those little SSD cards. So um, solid state drives are becoming really prevalent as far as um, uh, the means of storage just the limited amount of storage that cds can hold plus the fact that they're very delicate and that you know if you scratch a cd one thing that is important about cds and dvds is that they are permanent you, you can they're, they're one of the few forms of storage that is quote unquote permanent and that you can when you write to a cd a cdr and burn to a CDR or you burn it to a DVD, that DVD or CD cannot change um, uh, unless it's a rewritable one. And so they're still not a terrible idea to use them as a form of permanent storage, but just keep in mind that it's getting harder and harder to find devices that can read off of them. And again, the flash drives are becoming a more standard um, uh, 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 device for people to use as far as permanent storage. That's because they have no moving parts and are uh, certainly a lot cheaper now than they, than they used to be. That, that brings us up to the concept of storage. Now, traditional hard drives um, are have gotten a lot cheaper, as I, as I mentioned. They have the five terabyte drives now that are, are pretty reliable for considering the, the amount of memory that they hold. Um, uh, but they still have moving parts. They still need to be hooked up to a power supply or, or borrow the power supply of the computer itself. And they can crash due to a variety of dangers, um, which is, you know, probably their biggest, the biggest fear with most attorneys is that, you know, if you have a uh, shock to it, if it is exposed to water, if it's exposed to um, heat, if it's exposed to extreme cold, um, those drives stop working. Um, and so that's why we've seen an increasingly large number of people moving towards the flash thumb or SSD drive, which is a solid state drive, has no moving parts. Um, and the prices for these have come down dramatically. I mean, I remember when I first got my, uh, I guess it was a 128 meg um, USB drive, which was the envy of all my friends. I think I got it for a hundred bucks. I mean, I held a, a whopping 128 megs. I mean, who could use up 128 megs? I'm telling you, you know, not 128 gigs, you know, not 1.2 terabytes, but just one 128 megs. And it, it lasted a pretty good time. And I was able to use it for a lot of stuff because to me, hey, that was the equivalent of you know, nearly 200 floppy disks, you know, and that's, that's the, the irony of that is that, you know, granted, it seems like a lot until something, things seem 
like they hold a lot of information until you get to the next generation. And then that next generation usually dwarfs the previous one. And so, uh, uh, and offers greater features and usually greater storage and, and, and durability than the previous format. And so, um, uh, you know, now I know people who have basically a terabyte on a chip and that is even, you know, moving to, if you want to go to the high end, you can probably get two and three terabyte um, uh, 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 SSD cards to, to fit that much. Now, there is, a, there is a slight problem with something like that. I don't know if anyone's ever lost a micro SD card on the carpet or, you know, had it fall out of their phone or something like that on the street. But though, when you get things that are that small, it's easy to lose them. And so when you have HD card, these SD HD cards, I have at least four or five of them floating around my house. But I'm not sure where they are and I'm not sure what's on them. And so it is kind of hard to keep track of them. When data gets to be that small and that, you know, uh, 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 has that much information on it, it, it's, it gets a little bit harder to, to keep track. So, you know, it's kind of, sometimes it's nice to have a hard drive that's sizable enough that you know what it is, you know where it is, and you know you can check to make sure that it doesn't, you know, fall out somewhere and get lost. Um, let's talk a moment about operating systems. So that's the, it's the language that your computer speaks. And so we have three major um, players in the operating system um, area. I mean, Android obviously is one of them too, but not so much to talk about Android and or the iOS, but the, but mostly for computers, it's, it's Windows, it's Apple or it's Unix. And for a lot of people, they don't really understand that the Apple operating system, the Windows operating system truly are not the same. They are very different languages, like, you know, saying Chinese and French. They may share a lot of the same programs because things can be translated over, but not all of these programs work exactly the same way. Again, much like something that gets translated from one thing to another, the, there are functions in Word, for instance, on the Apple version of Word, because they don't have a mouse that right clicks as easily as as the uh, 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 one in uh, for Windows, then they have different locations and how you call up certain commands. Certain commands are brought up with different keys and other things that operate differently because of the, the, the framework of how uh, the Apple operating system works versus how the Windows operating system works. So in everything, there's usually some sense of translation that has to go on. Now, one of the big, Apple's biggest advantages and its biggest disadvantages is that Apple hardware is really for the Apple only. And, and that for Apple systems, you need to buy something that is Apple based for you to be able to get the most out of it. Now, that isn't always the case. I mean, you can, like, for instance, if you wanted to get a different mouse or different keyboard, you could get those, and they and Apple will work with those. Um, but some features may be disabled or only available on the Windows version of it, and it obviously won't match up because Apple loves everything to be white, and you're going to wind up getting probably may you might up wind up getting a black keyboard or black mouse, and and Apple often doesn't support other hardware being hooked up to it. So if you call Apple up and say, you know, I'm trying to hook my Zune up to, Zune was the old um, uh, version of Microsoft's uh, the iPod music player. Um, and so, you know, Apple will just throw its hands up and say, we don't, we don't, we don't work with that. If you want something, get an iPod or get yourself an iPhone, use it that way. Um, uh, so the fact that you have to go through an Apple authorized service dealer for most Apple repair 
Um, it's also pretty difficult in finding parts. Um, I mean, the, the one way that Apple can maintain quality is by controlling it and saying that you can only get parts for our machines from us. And that's kind of how they do it. Um, now, Windows is the majority of systems out there. It's estimated that probably about uh, uh, 80 to 90 percent of business systems are running on PCs. And that's because there's not much of a control put over other than once you buy the operating system from Microsoft, everything else is up to the end user to provide if they want to provide that. So you, know, you can build yourself a PC literally from scratch. And there's all sorts of manufacturers of PC parts and PCs themselves. So because of that, there's much greater competition, which lowers the prices and also means that there's more software that's available. Um, and a lot of that is coming from the mass compatibility that it has that drives the market to want to create more software for the greater number of machines. It sort of multiplies on itself. Um, that being said, because Microsoft has to go through such a large amount of uh, users and has to work in so many different environments, it's hard for them to control the operating system and a make it so that it works flawlessly with every configuration that you could possibly have and every piece of hardware and software that's out there not only that is currently out there but from the past and it's going to work with stuff in the future so windows has a tremendous challenge in trying to stay compatible and keeping itself up to date and the mass compatibility that it has creates a greater danger for the hacking and the uh, amount of um, uh, crimes can be committed through that computer system because so many people have access to it and it's present so much so that it's a lot of banks use PCs, obviously, a lot of uh, 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 businesses are using PCs. So if you're trying to hack something and you're trying to you know commit a crime you're going to be probably more likely to use the uh, uh a pc to try to, to hack through it because you're looking for a pc audience than you are an apple audience. and then um just the unix is the the black sheep of the os's um but it's still present in a lot of places where people aren't really paying attention, especially when we talk about the internet of things, and we're talking about devices like smart refrigerators and, and, and smart ovens and, and, and um, uh, things like your, your uh, a smart thermostat and other house control system. That's because Unix is a free operating system. It can run a lot of programs, but not all of them. So there are certain things that are, are real musts that people, um, uh, that's why they still buy PCs, that's why they still buy Apple, because there's some programs that just will not work or they don't have the Unix equivalent of it. And it does work a little bit differently than uh, the Windows does and for, than Apple does. And you have to do a lot of, you have to understand programming a little bit better and the operating system's a little bit better. It's not as friendly or as, as consumer-based. So a lot of people kind of feel intimidated by working with something like Unix because it's so, it's, it's so bare bones and you, you have to kind of know what you're doing to make it work. But for custom systems, it's very popular. So there are even uh, what they call the Raspberry Pi computers, which are, are tiny little um computers that are about the size of of your hand but they were what desktops were just like about four or five years ago and they come with uh the uh, unix operating system on them so that um uh, uh 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 people can use them for hobby systems and for programming their own robots and 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 and, and playing you know setting up their own like home video game systems and so forth, you know, like a like a standalone arcade 
cabinet. Um, they'll use those those Raspberry Pi systems for custom projects, and they'll use the Unix system because it's free and and I don't have to pay royalty fees for it. So um, let's talk a little bit about printers and scanners and OCR because printing and scanning is still an important part of the uh, uh, systems that the uh, businesses like law offices, they still get a lot of paper and they need to deal with the voluminous amount of paper. And I give a, a whole lecture about going paperless in the office and, and the process behind it, but just to explain what is going on, because a lot of, a lot of attorneys really aren't familiar when they say they're in a law office, but they just sent something out to be printed. They don't really know what, what the printing is, what printing is being done or how it's being done. And then they go to their own home office and they don't know what to select for a printer. So the, the, the main types of printers that you have now are inkjet and laser printers. And inkjet printers are cheaper. They, they do color printing pretty easily. They run on cartridges. But those cartridges tend to run out fast, especially the black ink, if you do a lot of documents. And that led to the uh, laser printer, which allows you to do inexpensive bulk black and white um, uh, using a toner cartridge uh, instead of a, an ink cartridge. And you can often do on one toner cartridge thousands of pages. Um, and then they have different color toner cartridges available for color, laser color printers. Um, but those tend to be a little bit more expensive and you have to, you know, refill the, the color toner um, cartridges, you know, on this, but you usually get a, a several hundred to several thousand pages, depending on what uh, type of uh, uh, printer you get. And so for a lot of firms moving over to laser versus staying with inkjet is a cost effective move even for the higher initial cost of the printer, they wind up saving money on cartridges and also the labor and just, you know, replacing cartridges. Um, and then with scanners, we're seeing the sheet feed flatbed or most likely a combination of the two uh, is really a very commonplace part of your modern law office. And so um, uh, you, the, I know a number of law offices that have scanners, um, a sheet feed scanners um, uh, called the scan snap at every secretary station. And when any piece of paper comes in, whether it's you know a, a bill or whether it's correspondence, they will scan it immediately and put it into their uh, uh, document database and code it right away so that they never have to deal with a piece of paper unless it's a signature, an important signature, like in a will situation or a contract. So, um, uh, and they use what's known as optical character recognition software, which is called OCR. And that turns type text into digital text by reading each character um, on the screen, you know, each character that's in uh, the document. It takes a picture of the document as an image, <clears throat> and then it looks, at you know the bent letters, it looks at these these squiggles on the pieces of paper and interprets is that a C, is that a B, is that an R, is that an S, and then it translates each one of those. Now you'd say, and it said it does it with ninety five percent accuracy. So you say to yourself, well, ninety five percent accuracy, that's great. Well, the problem is ninety five percent of a full page full of characters there's probably about 2,000 characters on a page, it's estimated, you, you know, when you type a full page of, you know, single line text, you get about 2,000 characters. In there. Well, if 5% of 2,000 characters are, are uh, mistyped, that's, you know, somewhere around like 100 mistyped characters, which isn't going to necessarily all be in a row. They could be couple next to each other it could be some in a batch could be maybe none at all you know the, the cleaner of, of a, uh, a document that you work with the better but if you're working with old text or a weird font or uh, the paper quality isn't very good or it was printed out from a fax 
on thermal paper and so it's all slippery and slick or the, it's dark text on a dark background or light text on a light background. All of that can, uh, can alter the results of an optical character recognition scan. So anything that's OCR needs to be checked for accuracy. It's, it's an unfortunate truth, but and so usually the best thing to do with OCR is to try to get whatever documents you can that are legacy documents, turn them into OCR documents once, and then not go back to them again. So the printed version of them again. Um, and to when you are dealing with uh, discovery of a client's document, to always order the digital version of the documents. I've seen lots of attorneys that will somehow accept bankers boxes full of printed stuff that the other side will print out um, and hand to them. And then they have to go and scan it and OCR it themselves at their expense and their time. Um, and that's just a huge waste of effort because there's nobody that's typing anything on a typewriter these days. Nobody's typed anything on a typewriter for, for a decade. So um, unless you know, you're know you subpoenaing something from you know the early 80s, the odds are it was done on a word processor. And so we should be able to discover the actual electronic files themselves and work with those. So those are always gonna be more accurate than the OCR files. Now, uh, obviously things are lost and, and print out, sometimes the printout is the only thing that you have that's available. And if that's the case, use it OCR, but then use the finalized OCR document that's corrected and try to you know, just archive the uh, uh, scanned image file, maybe even off site. Uh, the, the scan the uh, original printed file, maybe store it offsite so you're not using up a lot of space in the office. So let's talk a little bit about the different types of internet that is available to most law offices and the security that goes behind them. So um, for older law offices and ones that are in a lot of like older downtown areas, DSL, the digital subscriber line is still the only high speed internet that's available to them. And that uses standard phone lines, but usually it's gonna be slower than cable. Um, or if you try to get it to be as fast as cable, the expense is so much higher. But I don't know anyone anymore using ISDN lines or any sort of dedicated data line anymore. They're either using DSL or for the most part, they're using cable. Um, that's currently the fastest standard connection, but it is more expensive. And in a lot of locations, it's not available. Um, and to get cable to be located in their area will require trenching and so forth. And so some folks still have to stay with the DSL lines. Um, you are seeing a, a, an increasing use of satellite but for the most part, you'll need DSL to send, and then you'll use the dish for downloading the data, but the DSL is still being used to send upload information. Although people are using um, uh, their cell phones now as hotspots, if they're getting good enough reception and using their cell phone connection to connect to the internet and use that as a way to provide them with faster speeds than DSL and when cable is not available. Um, but keep in mind that when you're always on, and back in the days when, when uh, firms used dial-up, they were only susceptible when there was a, uh, uh, when they would sign on to the internet and then sign, then they'd be on for only a few minutes because they were being charged by the hour and then they would sign off. So in doing so, they would not, they, trying to catch, uh, company online was rare. You know, you had to time it right. But with a uh, uh, always on connection, you're, yes, you're accessing the internet, but the internet actually also has access to you constantly. And so when you uh, are on the internet constantly, you need to protect yourself because the opportunities there are 24 seven somebody to break in. And that's why um, I, I always recommend that you have a firewall that acts as a gateway or fence 
to your uh, internet connection and keeps people from spying in on your internet connection. And then you need antivirus protection, which is a burglar alarm and sort of a repair kit that allows you to be able to um, repair if a virus gets in and warns you what has gotten in and, and how you, you get rid of it. Because if you have one without the other, you're not really protected. Uh, a, a, a firewall without an antivirus is not effective because it means that if somebody downloads something and installs it, you're not getting the protection you need. But if you don't, and, but mostly I see people who have antivirus programs and don't have firewall. And that's just as big of a problem because if you have, if someone has the ability to spy on your computer, they're not damaging it. They're not sending a virus out to hurt your computer. But by sp spying on it, they can get a lot of information that you don't want to have exposed, especially as an attorney. If you're letting your client's information get exposed, that is an ethical violation. You're supposed to safeguard your client's information with the best possible means necessary. And just like it wouldn't be acceptable for you to leave your law office door open and the client files in an unlocked filing cabinet, it's just as as um, uh, uh, it's just as uh, liable, and it's it's just as bad a policy to um, have no antivirus, no, no firewall available um, to protect spying in on your data and your client's data at your law. So here's some um, hints um, on how you can get the most out of your computer. And that is, you know, a lot of, a lot of times attorneys get the computer and they go, well, I know that people can do certain things like this, but what do they really, you know, what are they doing on it other than, than you know, uh, sending email and, and uh, you know, getting on, on Spotify or YouTube. Well, a lot of the attorneys that I know, they, uh, they use it for, for research, looking up cases, looking up laws, and shepherdizing cases. Um, you can go to the uh, scholar.google.com location and get a lot of very impressive information that you would normally pay expert witnesses for uh, if you're looking to try to understand certain scientific principles or um, uh, uh, economic um, theories, that sort of thing, you can find that under the uh, scholar.google.com area. And then there's also a, a favorite of mine, which is an old fashioned um, site, and it's now been turned into a blog, and it's called uh, the Electric Law Library. And um, this has a lot of sample forms and a lot of links that you can um, click on that will allow you to get free re legal resources and information uh, for your uh, firm. You know, a lot of things that were created by um, attorneys that just in their practice, they donate their, their electronic files to this electric law library. And it's built up over the years. It's a very interesting site. Um, also, attorneys are really now in the, 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 the current COVID crisis that we're going through, are using online meetings for collaborative work and sharing. Um, uh, we're seeing Zoom, uh, MS Teams, and OneDrive being used. We're seeing Google Drive and Google Suite being used, and we're seeing WebEx being used. And, and one of the reasons that collaborative work and sharing probably will stay around even after the COVID crisis is that it really allows people not only the ability to work from any location that they're at, but at a moment's notice, you know which particular file is the master file that everyone's working on. In other words, um, what I've seen that's been a problem is that one attorney will work on a case and he'll have his or her version. He'll email it to somebody else. They'll work on it but somebody else is working on that file as well. And so then when the two people send that one person who worked on file, trying to figure out who has the most recent version of the file gets to be out of control. And then you have, you know, the file name being, you know, uh, uh, 
uh, uh, you know, file X edited by Mr. X at 4.54 p.m. on June the 5th, you know, that winds up being a file name and it gets out of control. If one file is kept online that is the master file, and you can go into that file, and put comments that are, or suggestions, or make edits, but those are redlined. In other words, they're shown that, that, that you are the one that's suggesting these edits, and then the master person in charge of the document chooses to either accept those edits or decline those edits. That gives you one solid document that everybody can look at. They can see who contributed to it, who revised it, what the final version is, what the past versions look like, and see the history of that document without having to trace down all the emails. And the other reason why that's helpful is that you don't want to have everybody download files on their own machines and working on them if you can avoid it. Because let's say that person then decides to leave the firm a week later. Well, you have to then erase their hard drive, or at least the parts of their hard drive that have your office's information on it if they were saving it to their own drive um uh and that can cause a lot of problems and you're not really in control of where that file goes let's say that person decided with that file to then email it to put it on a thumb drive or they they downloaded it to their phone and so now you have another copy of it leaked out somewhere else so if you have it in one spot and you know that nobody is downloading it, and everyone's working on it online, you have control of that one document. You don't have to worry about where it's going. And, and as we've seen, collaborative working through online has allowed people to avoid having to commute, having to travel, having to worry about um, uh, uh, being present physically at the office. And so it has made some people very effective and of course we're you're all listening to this through uh this was all recorded through a webex um uh, telephone seminar so i was able to do this from my office and yet i'm able to reach everybody through uh through the technology built into my computer here. so it's it's i think that's something that people are seeing a greater advantage of and they're seeing how effective it is working and, and that we've worked several months in this in this capacity so i have a feeling it's probably going to stay around for for quite a while actually. and then um uh a word on document formation um uh, uh a lot of attorneys aren't taking advantage of using templates in word and excel the reason why um you you want to use a template is that you can when you save something as a template you just create you know a blank form that has like say your your firm name on it and and dear whatever and then a signature block you save that as a form instead of saving it as a file like calling it um uh, uh, let's say you call it stationary one whatever okay if you make that as a regular file as soon as somebody saves hits save instead of save as they're going to save over that file and so that data that they put on it is going to open up every time they open up stationary one when you create a template and you hit save the name of the document is called document one at least in word that's how it works it, it gives it a generic name it won't let it save over the template unless you take extra steps to tell it no i want to change the existing template so that it, it has this new the, this new data on so it allows you to create these forms without accidentally saving over it or pulling up an old form retyping over it forgetting that you left something in the old form and being embarrassed when they said wait a minute my name is not smith or you know why is this money amount here when when throughout the document it's supposed to be you know uh Five hundred dollars an hour, and now you're saying seven hundred dollars, whatever. You know, it's 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 it's. If you start with something that's blank, you can't have that problem. If you keep resaving over the old document, it can lead to that that situation. Um, 
There's so many different templates that you can get from the Office 365 website, including a pleading paper template. Um, and I'm hoping that by the time my kids learn how to drive, there they'll be nine. So that's, I've got seven more years. I'm hoping the pleading paper is gone from the courts, but you know it's still there. And so if you do need it, you can get it from uh, the Office 365 template area. Um, there's also a lot of other great templates like like timelines and calendars and things like that. And then um, it's also uh, more and more attorneys are beginning to use Excel as sort of a poor man's database to sort by columns, rows, and using formulas for simple math. Um, and I'm seeing that more and more. Attorneys used to never touch Excel, but it's a great way to take things that just like lists of items or or dates and putting them in a linear format using the Excel spreadsheet as a way to do that. I've seen them do it a lot and it's not a bad, I mean, you can do that also in Word, but it takes more effort and people are just using Excel for that, which is just fine. Um, and then uh, forms are really great through Google Docs. I've been uh, going to the G Suite and through Google Docs area, you can create forms that you can send to clients and have them fill out online and the data that they give you gets put into a database that you can then read and find the results of the form answers um, directly from the, the Google Docs area. So that's something else you might want to check out sometime. And overall, the idea is to reduce the flow of paper and to control where your data is and knowing exactly what data you have in your system by being able to uh, have a digital version of it instead of piles and piles of it that you have to hire a secretary and a paralegal to go through manually to figure out what's in there. Um, the more you can reduce the flow of paper and the more you can turn it into electronic data, the easier it is for you to go through all these uh, pieces of information and find exactly what you're looking for. Um, then some other internet users are doing things like showing hard to reach locations from Google Earth. Um, if you're trying to use uh, uh, that for um, uh, trial purposes, I know that the attorneys have, have used Google Earth snapshots and also measuring distances with things like Google Maps. Um, just remember, you can use the, the screenshot or the print screen button or a screenshot to, to take a picture of something from Google Maps, and then you can paste it into Word. 3D paint or PowerPoint to be able to mark it up and use it as a as a as a uh, uh, diagram or map. Um, you can use Google Translate to translate documents from Spanish to English. It's not perfect, but it's a lot better than my high school Spanish allows, and at least give you the basis to communicate with certain people that you wouldn't be able to talk to otherwise. Um, I've used eBay and Amazon to evaluate different products. Um, eBay is sort of like the world's greatest garage sale. So, if, you know, you're going through a divorce and somebody's claiming that something is an antique that's worth, you know, a crazy amount of money, you can usually find um, an equivalent of it somewhere on eBay. eBay has just about everything now. So there's nothing that's so collectible or so unique that you won't find an equivalent of it on eBay. And then you can see if, you know, is this, you know, comic book really worth three thousand dollars you know in the conditions it's in you know or is it you know more like thirty dollars you know and um then obviously it's a great place for you know advertising as long as you stay within the ethical guidelines of your uh legal profession of your locality um uh, being able to join specialized groups say on on google uh, google's groups or on uh, 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 on Facebook, being able to provide information to the people that are members there um, as an attorney can um, help the public and also maybe generate business. And of course, there's things like LinkedIn and, and other uh, websites such as that. And Lexis and Westlaw and, and other legal-based uh, uh, areas where you can get 
great legal specific and job specific information, career specific information. So if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. Um, and I really appreciated being able to give you this lecture today. I hope it helps them answer a lot of questions and give ideas as to how you can get the most out of your computer system in your law office, serve yourself better and serve your clients. Thank you very much.